So project-based learning um, allows teachers to work with students to help them gain knowledge and skills by investigating and responding to authentic, engaging, and complex question, problem, or challenges. And I'm just reading off of the slide for a second here just so that we can read it together as well as think about what it is. So in this way, what the teacher does is that presents a real life problem to the student and or to the students in the classroom or whoever they're, they're instructing. And what they do with this real life problem is that they connect STEM ideas or concepts to it. And it's not actually very much any different from what we have been learning with UDL, but rather it's another concept that's used a lot in STEM education. And so I wanted to introduce it to you to help you see what other nuances that it may offer to the instruction of STEM education and how it can be connected to universal design for learning or differentiated instruction or anything else that you have been working on because it's just another skill that can be added to a STEM um, instruction toolbox for instructors. And then correspondingly, students learn by actively engaging in real world and personally meaningful projects. So are you gonna see a video shortly where students are going to actually solve a problem in their neighborhood and, um, and using what, what all of project-based learning um, highlights, which is, you know, driving a question or a challenge, the needing to know how to solve this problem, inquiry and innovation, using 21st century skills, making sure that students have a voice and choice. So if they're fighting for something in their neighborhood, for example, if there's lead in the water, or if the, you know, I mean, right now with, you know, they could, it could even be something with COVID, like there's enough, not enough, you know, medical care in the area that they're in or, um, whatever it is, like public health wise, people are not social distancing, et cetera, are wearing masks. It's their voice. They're, they're expressing themselves and we're giving that opportunity for them to voice that concern or their opinion that they have and validating it, which is very important for children. We need to really validate what they're thinking because that's what helps them gain the confidence in STEM. Um, feedback and revision. So this is where the teacher really gets involved with the student, provides feedback, gets into a conversation with the student about what they're thinking about. And then the student has an opportunity to publicly present this information. And I think that this is probably the most important part. So we have lots of things like science fairs in the United States, and I'm sure in other countries as well, you have science fairs or exhibitions where students get to talk about what they have learned or what they've done in an experiment. And it really helps them to, you know, formalize or even make the information they have even more concrete because they're expressing it a certain way. However, based on what we've learned in universal design for learning, it doesn't have to be a poster board for the science sphere, right? We can think of other creative, innovative ideas in which students can express what they've learned. And it could even be a street theater, for example. So if someone is worried about the, you know, contamination of water in, in their particular town or area, then they can have a street theater, play a little play about it to say, okay, this is part of public health. We're communicating information based on, you know, some epidemiological research that we've done in the town. So these are just different ideas. And so project-based learning, like I mentioned, is not necessarily anything different or, you know, completely um, new out of universal design for learning. All of these build on each other. It's just another term that's used quite a bit in STEM education, and it really involves thinking about a real life example in the process of learning STEM. Here's another graphic that I really like um, on project-based learning. So the benefits of project-based learning is, I'm just gonna highlight a couple of them, is that we see that students become much more empathetic, which is really what STEM education is about. It's not about, okay, I can solve this math problem and then I'm gonna get an A on a test and it's just for me. No, I solve this math problem because it helps me to maybe solve a global problem or a global challenge or helps to contribute. I don't necessarily need to solve something, um, but it helps me to contribute to work that's being done in this area. Um, you know, children can become better explorers. You know, they, they start to develop that confidence in themselves and they say, okay, Here's a STEM concept that applies to something in my neighborhood or in my community. And it just allows me to continue to explore these topics more and to start to apply them to other areas as well. They become much more engaged in learning. 
and uh, engagement is connected to motivation. Um, they're also able to take more creative risks because the more that we provide those opportunities for students to be creative and innovative, then they'll be more um, likely to say, okay, this is maybe a solution we haven't thought about. And it's something that scientists do every day on a day to day basis is they have to be creative, innovative. And I always say scientists and mathematicians are just like artists. You know, we have they're constantly, you know, thinking about the topics that they're working on or like seeing it around them. And, and that's one of the reasons why the innovation and creativity happens. Students also make deeper connections and between ideas and concepts. Uh, they also become better problem solvers and they become better at project management because they're taking a concept, a scientific concept that they've theoretically learned in a classroom and applying it to a real life community problem. So it really ties in some of the project management skills as well. So anyway, these are just some examples and I just wanted to highlight that. There I see two questions in the chat, so I'm just gonna take a look at those quickly. Um, so could authentic learning and problem-based learning be inter interwined or intertwined? I they they can be. So I mean authentic learning. It, they're definitely build on each other, and so if you look at the theoretical foundations, they would all they would all have similar theoretical foundations. The only reason why I'm not using authentic learning here is that we don't usually find authentic learning being used in STEM education. Some cases it is, but problem based learning has a very direct kind of um, connection to STEM education. But authentic learning could also be incorporated with STEM education as well because it's very. Um, it, because it really does help to um, help students be creative in their own process and have those innovative ideas that they could contribute. Um, and so I think, yeah, they, I think they definitely complement each other. So the next question is if the two methods of teaching differ from each other. I think they complement each other. I think in the entire umbrella of pedagogy, all of these different pedagogical techniques definitely complement each other. In STEM education, we see a little bit more emphasis on project-based learning. We see more direct correlation or connections with universal design for learning as well as the arts. And so you'll see that a little bit more, but it's not to say that you can't use other pedagogical techniques. That's a very good question. All right, so let me go to the next slide. Okay, so now here we're gonna watch a video. So hopefully this will work okay. Project-based learning is also referred to as PBL for short, so you may see that in some um, literature or examples. Okay, so we're gonna see an example of project-based learning. This is another example from the United States, so just to keep that in mind, but it has, very, um, it has a very clear understanding of how project-based learning is used. We won't watch the entire video, but just to get a gist of what they're doing. So this morning, concentration of lead was 1.0 parts per billion. I teach at an urban school, and environmental racism is something that plagues the community that our kids are from. So I was looking for a project that included this idea of environmental racism, but in sort of a larger context. The crisis in Flint would serve as the main case study that my students would focus on to explore this idea. I want you to consider different perspectives, a different compound you may think might work. One of the major issues with the Flint water crisis was that public officials did not include corrosive inhibitors. Uh, corrosive inhibitors are typically used to prevent lead leaching into the water system. And so the driving question for this project became, what is the most effective corrosive inhibitor? So there are three exhibits for this mystery piece. Here is how we're going to interact with the posters. We're going to use this thinking routine called see, think, and wonder. There are two for things you see. I see that. There are two for I think. My interpretation of what I see is. And then I wonder. I have a question, and this is my question. So we kicked off the project using mystery piece. And the purpose of the mystery piece was to captivate the student's interest in the particular topic that we'd be studying, but fully giving it away. And so the mystery piece consisted of pictures, text, graphs, images of 
different water prices. And the purpose of this was basically to spark the curiosity of the students. I wanted them to make an emotional connection to this project. So the big reveal, this semester, we are going to be studying water quality, okay? And we're gonna be looking at Flint, Michigan. I was fortunate enough to see all of the really interesting ideas you posted. What I want you to do now is make that public to your group. When you're letting yourself to fight for water when it should be all right, and people still, people on Flint still don't have clean water, Years. I also wonder if the schools do choose to shut the fountains down, what are they going to use as a replacement? And so during our whole class debrief, I used another protocol I used to think and now I think. And uh, one of the students thought about Flint, but his thinking got challenged because of some of the images that we saw. Our learning targets for today are I can design experiments to test the inflation gross inhibitors. I can develop a testable hypothesis. I can generate that hypothesis based on my research. So after the Okay, we won't watch the entire video. I can share the link with you, so you can definitely take a look at it. Um, it's it's a pretty long video. It's about um, seven minutes, but just to kind of give you an idea or a sense of you know what the what project based learning is, and you can see it's very much connected to a lot of the other discussions that we've had on STEM pedagogy, and it it does you know build on that. But it's it's a topic or a word that's used quite a bit in. Um, Sorry, I'm just going to share my PowerPoint again. It's a topic that's used uh, quite frequently with STEM education. So I wanted you to have this as well in your toolbox, as well as skills or strategies that you could potentially use in your communities. And I see there's a couple of more questions in the chat. So I just want to make sure I address that before going forward. Uh, so I see one more as I think problem based learning engages students' toy content. Uh, sorry. Toy construct knowledge and develop skills, which after all become their authentic learning. Okay, that's an excellent connection there. Very good because they own their own learning. Yeah, so I like that's a very good connection. And I think, you know, like I was saying that under the umbrella of pedagogy. You know, it's, it's very important um, to, um, to make these connections as well and see what other approaches or strategies that you've already been using. Can connect to um, the information that I'm providing here, so that that was, that's a very good response. So authentic learning is definitely important here as well, um, but at the same time, you know how how you want to frame it, you can definitely use the the term authentic learning as well. So thank you for bringing that up. Let me share my screen or share the slides again. Okay. And the other example I wanted to talk about. And it's like I was mentioning, it's not to say that some organizations or some approaches are only project based learning. They definitely incorporate universal design for learning, differentiated instruction. They also incorporate arts, but I just wanted to give an example of um, 1, then 1 organization or a museum that's based in the Bay area in California, and they're going to be presenting on Thursday. So I thought it would might be good to also talk a little bit about them. And many of their lesson plans have also been incorporated into our STEM toolkit. And you'll see in Nepal, they actually did, uh, Binod, I'm going to show your video. In Nepal, they did one of the, um, one of the uh, lesson plans from this museum. So you'll see the actual implementation of that. And one of the things, you know, you can go to the, the tech interactive and I'll send the website to everybody as well. The, and on their website, you can go to their grand challenges and their grand challenges are really nice because they each have a very practical connection to it. So, for example, you know, you're building, um, you know, uh, a hovercraft that can navigate different terrains. And so it's kind of thinking about the environment. So maybe not everything is connected to uh, environments or communities that children live in, but at least, you know, you start to see some of these connections. Another one of the other. Another lesson plan that they have that I don't have in this list right now or in this screenshot is um, they, you know, a student is surround, uh, sorry, people are um, uh, stuck rather on an island and they have to figure out a way that they can get like resources or medical supplies to the, to the people on the island. So it's kind of, it has a very real life example, but the previous video that we saw was very nice because it was a problem in their community in Flint, Michigan 
that they were trying to solve. So if we can kind of make those connections, those are really nice. And the Tech Interactive really has great templates and lesson plans that can be used. And then, you know, your community problems can be addressed in those in those particular lesson plans. So I just wanted to highlight this. I will share the website as well, but they they'll also be talking in more detail about the work that they're doing on Thursday. All right, so now let's see the example from Nepal. So stop sharing. And then Binod, I'm gonna call on you so you can talk a little bit about it. Sure, sure. Okay. So, Benod, you want to talk a little bit about this project? Uh, okay, thank you. Thank you, Deepa, uh, for sharing this video. So, as, as you have seen in this video, uh, we, we uh, the, the project, the name of the project was No Soil, No Problem. And then we prepare a unit of hydroponics in the schools. And, and the, the, the process was that I and then uh, I myself and we have one Sanjay Kumar Panta is here. He was more involved in this particular project and we invited students to interact in this particular activity since the beginning. So we asked that, is it possible to uh, grow vegetables without soil? So almost all students told that, no, no, it's not possible. So how can we grow without soil? And then and later on, we, we slowly uh, moved to, uh, to the idea that what are the, what are the things that we need uh, to, to grow the plants? And then we we inter we requested them to prepare our models with the help of some locally available materials, and then we purchase these items. And the teachers and ourselves and students themselves we prepare a unit of hydroponics. As you can see, that uh, we also this planted and then we grew it. And then all teachers, normally language teachers, also um, this ask students to write some of the paragraphs about that the the process of making hydroponics and then how did you feel it and then uh, also what type of uh, uh, challenges or the this global crisis can be minimized through so, through such uh, uh, such projects and especially the science teachers was very much interested because we prepare the food for these plants and then the science teachers herself was very much engaged during the process and she, she realized that uh, such kind of STEAM projects is very uh, helpful. And the, the most interesting part is that the community people also were engaged during that process. They, they, they came in the schools and they observed or oh, 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 it is also possible. And then in, in one of the community, so and few community members have decided that now they will also keep the unit of hydroponics uh, in their home and then they, they will practice these things. I think it was it was very much interesting and then that particular project created a discourse among community and then even 
in, in, in the local government. And then we, we are also trying to help people to establish another unit of hydroponics in, in the community member. So thank you for uh, providing such a great opportunities uh, to implement this project. Thank you, Deepa, and thank you to all. Yeah, no, thank you, Vinod, for expl explaining the project and everything. And if you could just stay on for a few seconds, if anybody has any questions for Vinod and his team on what he did, because this is one of the lesson plans that is from our STEM toolkit. It's very much community oriented and, you know, like Vinod said, it started a discourse <laughs> among the community as well. So, yeah, I think uh, we got a, a very interesting in the chat. Cool project. Okay, thank you. Yeah, if there's any, I'll just any other questions. I'll just give a couple of one minute or so before we move on because this was a fun project to to see. And you can also unmute yourselves if you'd like. You don't have to type it in the chat box. Okay, it was such a rich project with different members collaborating. Yeah, very much. That's true. Okay, well, even if you have a question, um, so we know that I may ask you to come back later on to talk a little sure, bit about sure. Sure, um, sure. Oh, there is one question for you. Uh, how much time did you spend on the project implementation? Uh, yeah, okay, thank you for this question. But uh, while implementing this project, the time was really difficult for us because due to this COVID-19, uh, so we were in the situation of lockdown. And then, uh, so normally uh, this, we, we invested uh, around uh, two around two months. If, if we just uh, calculate the number of days, so it took around two months because we had to seed the plants, and then uh, we, we we took around two weeks to just uh, fix the unit of hydroponics. Because uh, so at the beginning we we were just thinking to establish that unit of hydroponics in a very small unit. But once we interacted with the school teachers and with other community members, and they were also very much excited, and then we also requested to the university and university also kept us a certain additional amount and then we, we were able to establish uh, in, in a very big uh, that that is big hydroponics unit and it took almost uh, uh, two to three months okay thank you Benod. and you have one more question what type of lessons did students have to prepare uh, them for the implementation of the project Okay, so uh, uh, because while implementing the project, the uh, the easiest part was that uh, we we just brought that projects prepared by this uh, from Global Stream Toolkit. Now all the steps were uh, written in that in, in, in that papers, and then we followed as it is. And just what we did, we just at the beginning uh, there were math teachers, science teachers, and language teachers. And we just shared our ideas and we provided that lesson plans to them and we asked them to connect in their lessons. And then uh, we have several subjects in our local level. So we, we do have science and technology. I know we do have mathematics. We do have language in English and Nepalese. And we do have occupation related subjects. And normally those four or five teachers, uh, they sit together and then they connected their lesson plans. So, for example, in lower grades, if you saw that video carefully, in the lower grades, we just ask math teachers uh, to make them observe this unit of hydroponics and then ask them to count and ask them to measure the length of that hydroponics unit and ask them to calculate the area that hydroponics unit has covered, ask them to uh, count the number of holes and the area that is holes where we plant that seeds. So, in these ways, uh, we prepare uh, questions in different layers, in different levels. So, in, in, for the students who are in grade seven and eight, uh, so we discuss about this that chemical that we have to use in that water and the amount of chemicals, the 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 particular uh, the work of that chemical, that what that what what uh, why that particular chemical is needed for the for the plants. So, in this way, uh, we we interacted. Uh, students from we engage students from grade four to eight according to this uh, grade levels and the curriculum uh, that is prepared in nepali context and then that was very much interesting we really enjoyed this project in fact we really enjoyed it yeah we could see from the video as well like it, even the kids were really excited you know to record yeah. their observations and you know there are, there are a couple of videos on this and maybe we can share them out um at some point but you know there's even when the kids first see the, you know, the plants growing or whatever, the, even lettuce, you grew lettuce, right? And everything else, 
um, you know, they were so excited to see like, oh my gosh, it's growing, it's growing. <laughs> they were, you know, that observation to see their faces, it was very, um, it was very nice to see their faces. All right, thank you so much, Binod. And I, you got another thank you, I think, in the chat. Thank you, Binod, I love the integration of subjects. So, um, I'm, yeah, we can definitely continue these conversations, but it's nice to, to see how others have implemented and um, learn from each other on this. So, thank you so much, Binod and team. All right, so we'll now move on to All right. So, yeah, I, I, we had a little bit of reflection time for, for this, but I also wanted to just open it up for any reflections that people have about project based learning. And I really liked the conversation um, on connecting authentic learning um, to um, project based learning because it's, it also even goes a little bit with the who. I think Indra Mani, you had mentioned that it's like who is. Who is working on this, you know, so it kind of creates a little bit of ownership with the students. So, I, I liked that connection a lot. That was really great. I also learned something because I had not made that connection before. So, thank you. Any other questions about project based learning or reflections, thoughts, or anything that you'd like to share with the group? You can also unmute yourselves if, if that's easier. Yeah, any, um, any other kind of observations, you know, how do you find project based learning? Do you feel that you're already doing it in your communities or with the schools or students you work with? Or if there's some connections that you've seen based on universal design for learning, or even the 1 of the previous comments, like connecting it to other pedagogy that you use in the classroom. Okay, so we have Marbella says that I feel like project based learning helps prepare learners for real scientific fields, giving them an opportunity to carry out the work they might do. I definitely agree with that. I, I think that it really helps them to make those stronger connections between the concepts that they learn to um, real scientific fields. Yeah, that's a really good point. Any other thoughts? And feel free to keep, you know, using the chat box to share um, when I'm sharing it sort of just pops up because I won't have this box open. So I may not see it immediately, but I, I but I do see that there's a chat. So feel free to continue to use the chat box or you can uh, indicate that you want to um, unmute yourselves and say something. Okay, so the last topic, so we went through universal design for learning. Project based learning, and then the last topic I want to go through with everyone is STEAM education. And, you know, as I mentioned in the last five, six years, STEAM education has become quite popular, particularly in the United States, and then it's slowly spreading to other countries as well. Uh, I know that in Nepal, Binod's um, university actually has a master's that teachers or students can um, get in, in STEAM education, which is fascinating, which is really um, great. And so STEAM basically, as many of you probably already know, the A stands for arts. And one of the reasons that, you know, what we were talking about earlier is that scientists and mathematicians are very similar to artists because they're constantly innovating, creating, um, thinking about the world in very different ways in order to come to a solution. And each of us may have different solutions to get to that to the answer of a problem. So it's it's a nice way because it really integrates that thinking across the different fields. And it's and so the it this hits the first bullet point that I have here that it's interdisciplinary. And one of the things is that we see that a lot of scientific concepts, having a strong scientific knowledge or scientific concepts, understanding of scientific concepts rather, really helps in the field of arts. And there's this really interesting research um, that was done by a professor, a researcher named Duncan, and he looked at students learning mathematics in the early grades, so in elementary or primary grades, and he noticed that if students had a stronger foundation in mathematics, they actually were better in reading and language arts. But when students did not have a strong foundation in mathematics, they also suffered in reading and math in um, language arts. And you know, it really it shows that. 
math because it's so abstract and you know very con you know it's very conceptual, um, very much like around us. Children can understand quantities even before it's formally taught to them, or even manipulate numbers up to three even though even before it's um, formally taught to them. So it really shows that how STEM as well as math and other concepts in that in the area really connect to the arts and really uh, complement them and really strengthen anything that we we do in the arts and also vice versa like as we're allowing ourselves to explore um you know scientific concepts in the arts it also strengthens the stem topics so i think that they really complement each other very well and there's also research to support that they they're very complementary uh so you know arts is a part of stem education i um, I, I don't consider myself an artist, but I, I do love the arts. And one of my passions in life has always been to see how I can connect the arts with STEM education. And so I, I did some work, uh, this again, I'll come back to a project that I did in India several years ago, where we worked with students in India to, um, this was outside of world learning, but we worked with students in India to integrate arts concepts into existing STEM programs. Um, there and I'll, and I'll show a couple of examples of that. And it also really allows students to explore their social and emotional thinking. And I'll, and I'll show you some examples around this too. But when you think about different ways to express yourself, if I said that, you know, you know, you got, um, you won the lottery and the only way that you were able to express yourself was to write a five page essay. I think then you would not be very happy about, I mean, you'd be happy about winning the lottery, but then you're like, why do I have to express myself in a five page essay in order to get my cash, right? But if there's different ways of expressing yourself, I just wanna jump up and down. I wanna shout, I wanna call my mother. I wanna do this. Then it, it allows you to take those feelings that you have and express it in a way that is your personality. And some people may not wanna express it. They're like, okay, I won the lottery, but I don't wanna talk about it. And that's okay too. So I think it really allows um, the social and emotional aspect of it. And then that also relates a lot to confidence building, self-esteem and uh, self-efficacy. So I think those are, it's very much connected that way. Okay, this is a nice pyramid. I just wanted to show it. We don't have to go through everything in detail, but I wanted to just show this so that you can see how the liberal arts or the arts can, are kind of, are connected rather with, with STEM education. So if you have like science, technology, engineering, mathematics, and the pyramid shows the different areas that these focus on um, and how each of them are silos. But when we think about an interdisciplinary approach, math of course is used in engineering and technology and science, but then the arts could also be you know, uh, used across the, the different fields as well. And so it just kind of gives an example and I'll provide a few more examples um, after this slide, but this is just a visual I wanted to to show that that you know we have specific content then we have the silos the different areas then we have multidisciplinary which is stem education without the arts then we have an integrative approach which is includes steam education and then that eventually leads to lifelong holistic learning because it really addresses the social and emotional aspect as well here's another uh, example that i it's, it's part of a larger brochure and I can send the link to the larger brochure. This is from the University of Florida, but they've actually documented, they have evidence to show how STEAM education is a much, um, you know, helps students learn more or learn, learn better, learn STEM better rather. And, you know, for example, they've written here that if they're four, students are four times more likely to be recognized for academic achievement when we include the arts with STEM. They're three times more likely to be awarded for school attendance. Um, here, 93% of Americans believe that the arts are vital to providing well-rounded education for children. 86% of Americans agree that the arts education encourages and assists in the improvement of a child's attitude towards school. So it provides a lot of information and background evidence that you know, could really support STEAM education, especially if we're thinking about developing partnerships, getting funding, things like that. Okay, so I'm going to, I see there was one comment, so I'm just gonna peek at the chat box really quickly. All right, so we have um, from, from Nepal. Okay. 
Yeah, there's a link. Okay, sorry. I'll just quickly summarize, but there's you, everyone can see the chat box, but there's a link on this uh, STEAM education program in Nepal, one of the publications rather. Thank you, Binoth, for sharing that. Okay, so um, this organization or this initiative that I worked on, I, I actually did a, I did a Fulbright in India several years ago. And one of my Fulbright colleagues and I decided to create um, an initiative to work with the schools that we were working with in India, and we called it Art Light Global. And Art Light Global um, focuses on STEAM education programs for these communities that we worked with in India. And so we had um, two different workshops that we did with them. And I'll, I mean, we had, we had several workshops, but I'm gonna talk about two of them that we did. So one is visualizing math, and this is for middle schools, uh, middle school students rather. And here we took concepts of ratios, proportions, estimation, measurement, and we connected it to concepts in art as well as social and emotional learning. And in this project, students drew portraits of themselves based on four by six, so eight by 10 portraits based on four by six pictures that they had. And it was a really great way to express like a self-expression of themselves using concepts of math and art. And it was a very low resource. I mean, we were on our Fulbright, so we didn't have much money. So it just cost $200 for about 60 students. So it was a very low resource um, activity and it had a really a big impact. And the students actually sold the portraits that they made the, of themselves for their school. And I think we raised close to $1,000, 1,000 US dollars for, for the school. And the second project that I'm going to talk about is design and environment, and this was more for high school students. So we we targeted to eight tenth grade students, and here students learned about concepts of design, architecture, geometry, and trigonometry, and they designed canopies for their school um, from recycled materials like plastic and other trash. And so through this process, they learned about environment using concepts of math and design. And here the cost was $150 because we we're using a lot of recycled materials. So the, one of the pictures that you saw earlier, the students had you know, garbage bags and we would ask them to collect trash. And again, it was very hygienic, the whole process. We had gloves for um, the students as well as um, it, it telling them what is good to collect and what's not good to collect. So we didn't have anything unsanitary. Okay, so this is the visualizing math um, project that we did. And this is just an example picture on the left hand side where the students had to develop colors, you know, so we have the primary colors, but then they had to develop colors that they would use for their portraits. And their colors were, it's all a ratio, it's learning ratio. So how much orange, green, and yellow are they using to develop this color? And in a way, they're making up their own colors because they're they, you know, it's, it's very unique. Each of the portraits are very unique. So it was a really nice process for them to be creative in kind of developing their own colors, even though a lot of them may have formal names, but we wanted to give them that um, creative license to say, okay, I have this, this is the ratio of this particular color, and this is the ratio or the color that I'm going to use on my portrait. So I have developed it. And um, so it was a really nice activity for them to understand not just the primary colors, which is also physics relates to physics and science, but at the same time, use the mathematical skills to develop their own, you know, use their own creativity to develop their own colors. And then here are some portraits that were developed, and this is during a showcase. We had a visitor. This is, she's actually um, uh, a pretty important person in the city. So she had come to visit the, the school and the, the portraits that the students had made. And this is one of the portraits you can see, or three of the portraits rather. And each of them were so unique because it really reflected the personality of the student. So this student who's talking about his portrait, which is in the center right here, um, he used this blue color in the background because he said, you know, he was kind of talking about where he grew up and, you know, how things behind him might be blue, but he just kind of sees himself kind of coming out of the community, which was very poetic and artistic and very talented child. He's, um, he was only in the eighth grade at that time. Here's another picture from the same program, and here uh, these two, this this portrait belongs to the girl on the left-hand side, and her friend is helping her. Uh, one of the issues that we faced is that a lot of students did not like, um, were very um, concerned about their skin complexion or the color of their skin, and you know they they didn't want to color the portraits the the actual color of their skin tone because, in a lot you know. 
all over the world, I would say, um, you know, there is a little bit of a complexity or people can have a complex about the color of their skin. And unfortunately, um, the students that we were working with, you know, um, if you have a darker color skin tone, then it's seen as, you know, ugly or, you know, there are other um, issues with it and they had low self esteem around it. But we wanted them to say that, you know, hey, that's beautiful too. You know, however you look is beautiful. It's really like whatever is inside of you, whatever you're contributing to this world is is what you're um, what you're bringing and whoever you are, you're, you know, you're an important person. So through the process, we we had a lot of social and emotional activities to help them understand that they can create colors, but it doesn't have to be a lighter color than their skin tone. Um, it doesn't have to be white and it, you know, it can be the actual color of their skin tone and that brown is beautiful. And so this, this girl, um, she was not really sure if she wanted to color her portrait, but then she eventually did. And then her friend said, why don't you put brown is beautiful on the top of the portrait? And that's what she did. And um, so it was a really nice um, self-esteem building activity, confidence building activity for the students as well. Okay, and this is the second project that we did with them. And you can see these canopies that the students developed and, you know, canopies can be used at, at kind of at the, um, the roof of a school and things can be hung from them. And so we collected, these are actually all refurbished materials. Most of them are refurbished. These poles are from a construction activity that um, was in the neighborhood and the, the constructors didn't need these poles anymore. They were going to throw them out. So we took them and then, you know, students use newspaper as well as some other, you know, very simple um, materials to develop these canopies. And they used um, concepts of math as well as design and also learned about the environment because what they hung from the canopies, they made each kind of like an artistic representation of the canopies. I think it's in the next slide. Yeah. They, um, they took like yogurt <laughs> um, bottles and plastic bags and other things that they had seen and they wanted to create like an artistic uh, representation on the canopies and you can change it out so you can untie what's on the canopy and tie something else. So they really enjoyed the process. It was, it was a lot of fun for them. And in the back, you'll see pictures. Um, another activity that we do with the students is um, it's, it's a word poetry or a slam poetry um, activity where we just ask them to cut out random words in a newspaper and then start to piece it together. And then when they piece it together, they realize that there's, you can create poetry or a story out of it. And it's really nice because you see the, um, you know, if you look at um, Shakespeare or any other poetry, there is a very mathematical um, approach to how passages are written out. So it kind of helps the students to say, okay, this, you know, you know, this particular line has like five beats to it or, you know, whatever it is. And so it, it's, it's a nice way. It's another activity that we do with them and they really enjoy doing that. And they have some pictures on the wall of, of things that they've done as well. All right, so any reflections on this? STEAM education. And feel free to unmute yourselves. I think this is my last slide, so I can actually also go back to the group. Oh, no, I have one more slide. Or if you even have a question for Binod about his um, program, Binod and team, you can definitely um, ask him as well. Okay, thank you, Indramani. Yeah, definitely the multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary, transdisciplinary in STEAM plus A is, is STEAM. STEM plus A rather is STEAM. Any other thoughts or questions? I'll give it another 30 seconds and then I'll move on. Has anyone tried arts in their program besides the team in Nepal? We have a couple of comments coming in. All right, so Binod, arts integration seems great in the examples. We call it arts includes ethics and values where STEM normally does not. 
Yeah, that's a very good point, Benoit. And Monica says, it's so important to allow children to express themselves in different ways, and art can also be part of their scientific expression. 100% agree. Agree. Marbella says, I want to do more reading about the benefits of arts on other STEM subjects. Yeah, I can direct you to some reading on this, Marbella, and um, we can definitely look, look into other areas if you're interested. Yeah, we can, we can work together on that. And feel free to unmute yourselves if you'd like to speak or ask a question or if you have a thought to share. I almost want to say, or if you have a song to sing, <laughs> since we just did I, arts. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. I, I have a question. Um, the examples that you gave really showed a meaningful way of, of expressing learning through art. I wonder. I have sometimes seen students and teachers put a lot of thought into the presentation of something that they're making in a school context in a way that seems to me to be at the expense of the ideas behind it. Mm -hmm. um, I know that that's it, it's possible to put a lot of thought into the presentation uh, and have have meaningful ideas. Uh, but sometimes it seems to me that I see an emphasis on making it look pretty, but not necessarily meaning anything. And I wonder if you have any thoughts about um, how how to ensure the kind of examples that you're showing where there is uh, really something meaningful uh, behind the expression through art. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, that's an excellent question. And, you know, it's interesting when we did the portraits with the students, one of the um, art teachers, they, they had three art teacher, teachers that rotated in that school. Like they, they didn't have a full time art teacher, but they had various teachers that came in. And one of the art teachers came and saw the portraits and he was telling the students, oh, your nose is off or your your ear is off and this is off. And so we had to tell the principal, can you ask, can you kindly ask this art teacher not to come back? <laughs> because that was not the purpose of our of our activity. What they did was is that they they used um, the Cartesian coordinate system from the from the smaller pictures that they had and they drew the grid and they plotted out their points. So they had different points that they had to plot out. And then they scaled it up onto a larger canvas. And so when they scaled it up, we just wanted them to get the dimensions of their face. So, you know, if this was like, you know, five, seven, and this one was three, two, whatever, these different sides of the face, we wanted them to be able to plot that on a scan on a canvas. And so if they had the general framework of their face and their bodies, we were okay with that because they've learned how to scale up using Cartesian coordinate, the Cartesian coordinate system. And then with the ratio of the paints, it was very similar. We didn't we didn't care if if the color already existed. Um, we weren't. Our intention was not that they had to learn the names of the colors, but we wanted them to understand what the ratios were of the different paints that they were putting together. Because if they took like five of a red and one of a yellow, you know, one proportion in proportion sense, and we gave them small measuring um, spoons and things like that to be able to measure out. But if they did that and then they put two one as a ratio, it, it, that's not that's not that wasn't the purpose of that activity. The purpose was to um, to understand. Okay, they've actually taken five little teaspoons of the yellow and then one or red or yellow. I can't remember which one I used, but but you know just to make sure that they've gotten those proportions correctly because it's not just for painting, but it could also apply to cooking or when you're doing a scientific experiment. So when they actually drew out their portraits, we didn't care how their nose looked or how their mouths looks. You know, I mean, some of them were a little bit off and it was okay. We wanted them to have that. It was more of that Cartesian card coordinate system. We wanted them to understand ratios and proportions. So the presentation necessarily wasn't always, you know, it wasn't necessarily like a you know, professional artist, but that was okay. You know, and we told them that was okay. Throughout the whole process, they were afraid. They're like, oh, we don't know how to draw a nose. We're like, it's okay. You know, draw a triangle and then two little holes, and that's totally fine too. Um, and they learned, I mean, they're using the concept of a triangle, you know, so 
that's all we really emphasized. I hope that helps. Yeah. So, so what I understood, if I just want to check it, um, what I understood from what you said is that there's very specific guidance as to how to uh, use this artistic expression um, with these concepts. It's not just like express yourself in this very open way. It's 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 a very specific task with specific steps and and guidance how to how to apply it. Exactly. Very much. Yeah. So everything is you know it has it's a very guided instruction in that sense. Yeah. And then really allowing students to have that creativity so they don't feel confined, but the teacher definitely needs to have that um, that guidance to be able to to guide the students in that direction. Yeah, that, that was a great question. Thank you for asking that. So we have. Um, so Sanjaya Kumar from N Nepal, he says in one of the lessons on the global, in this global STEM toolkit, um, in Nepal, they made a bird nest and feeding table in a very artistic way. Oh, that's very cool. Um, that's very interesting. And it's in the save the species challenge. Yeah. And um, Adeline, you know, in, in the toolkit, the lesson plans that you find will also give teachers that that instruction that you're asking about. So it's not that they're going to emphasize more in the presentation over kind of the instruction or the quality of um, learning the material or learning the content. So, if, as you're looking through the lesson plans, if you have any questions, you'll, you can feel free to reach out to us. Okay, I think um, I'm running short on time, but I, I'll quickly go through the others. So, Marbella, there can be a lot of judgment in the arts as well. Yeah, I agree. Looking for perfection and it can be off putting, similar to how students feel like if they don't know, if they don't have what it takes to be an artist or scientist. Exactly. And I think that's where um, it's not that we're trying to train students to become artists. But we're using art as a medium or an approach to strengthen their STEM concept or their ideas and it's, it's a, and their creativity process. So I think that's kind of something that we have to tell students as they go through the process. It doesn't have to look perfect. And there's also no such thing as perfect, you know, like everyone has a very art is very subjective as well. So making that point is very important. And Justin says also, there's a strong separation between the 2 art is a soft subject. Science, et cetera, are seen as hard subjects, and this is a very con a conventional understanding. That's correct, Justin. And I think one of the things is that my the person that I worked with on this program, she's actually an artist and an art educator, and I'm more on the science side. But the way that we think and the way that we approach problems is is quite similar. So I think we we found a connection that way. So it also helps students to see that arts is not necessarily being a a softer area, but it's also a very thought provoking creative process and how scientists and artists think very similarly. So that's another thing that we uh, that we wanted to um, show the students. All right, so we we're almost um, out of time. I just want to quickly go through the next slide and then I will stop. And if there's any questions, you, you can definitely ask me after um, the um, afterwards as well. So I just wanted to quickly go through a problem solving process based on the pedagogies that we've gone over today. Very similar to the scientific process, science, uh, the scientific learning process or the scientific process. So um, this is just something for you to take away to work on. You don't have to necessarily use these seven steps, but it's something to sort of take away with um, from the session today. So we explore an issue, we state what is known, we define the issues, we research the knowledge, investigate solutions, present and support the chosen solution, and then review your performance. And review can be anything from presentation to talking to a peer, to drawing an art, uh, you know, to drawing a sketch, things like that. And I think that's it. I just wanna, so we're next, you know, I'll be talking about contextualizing STEM programs on Thursday. So I just wanted to tell you a little bit about that. And that's it, I'm done so we can take our break. And if there's any other questions, feel free to put in the chat and I will stay on during the break time to answer the questions in the chat. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>